God, in the presence of God this morning. You look good. Thank you for just being so passionate in your worship. We are glad to have Mario, Pastor Mario here with us today. Uh, I know you guys in Sterlington are missing him, but man, thanks for sharing him. Such an incredible leader and just a huge part of what we do around here at Christ Church. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4. As you're turning there, let me just talk to you a little bit about something that's coming up that is not in the video announcements. Everybody say March the 13th. That is our second, second Wednesday service of the month. I don't know if you've been to the last couple of our worship nights. They have just been incredible. Last, uh, last month in February, it was on Valentine's Day. Such a beautiful time in the presence of God. And we were able to pray over couples and bless couples. And during that service, I just felt and have just strongly felt and sensed that of what the March one was supposed to be like. And so, I, I mean, it was, church was barely over and I was driving home and I was calling dad and I was like, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm sensing. What do you think? And he was like, let's go for it. So on March the 13th, we are going to be having a night of hope and healing where all locations are gonna be gathering right here at our West Monroe location and it's going to be a night to we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to the needs of our lives, you know, the truth is that every single one of us that walked into West Monroe or Sterlington or Ruston, we walked in here needing a healing. It may be a physical healing. It may be emotional healing. It might be a mental or a relational or even a spiritual healing in our lives. And to be honest, we're, we're no different than the people who were alive when Jesus walked the face of the earth. I mean, you look through scripture, people needed a touch from God. I mean, you see parents with kids that needed a healing from Jesus. You, see, you saw people who needed their, their, their physical ailments healed, relational, spiritual healing, people needing. And, and, and even though they may not have completely understood who Jesus actually was, they did know that he was their only hope for the healing that they needed in their lives. And you see Jesus healing them. And in a myriad of different ways. I mean, sometimes he would lay hands on them and they would be healed. Sometimes he would just speak and instantly they would be healed. Sometimes the, uh, it, it would, uh, sometimes he would, one time he spit in the mud and they were healed. One time he sent them away and said, go show yourselves to the priest and they were healed. Regardless of how Jesus wants to heal, it's our job and it's our responsibility as believers, to recognize that, that he is the great physician, that he is the great healing. And so I'm asking us as a church family to start preparing your heart. Maybe it's you getting into the word and start and picking out the scriptures, talking about healing, reading the stories where Jesus healed people throughout scripture and getting our expectation ready for what God wants to do on March 13th. It's gonna be at 6.30 right here. Dad's gonna bring a word, building up our faith and we're gonna allow God to heal our lives the way that we need them to be healed. He is our only hope. And so I'm challenging you. If you know somebody in your world that needs a healing, get them to church. On Wednesday night, March 13th, it's gonna be a powerful night. Amen? Amen. Amen. That was my little spiel for that night. Luke 4, y'all ready? It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He starts off by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've been chewing on that for a little while. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Some of you may have particular sports teams that you really like. Uh, maybe you like the New Orleans Saints or maybe it's ULM or Tech or Grambling. And, and, and a lot of times, when we really like a team, we, we kind of, when someone asks us, well, well, I'm a saint, or I'm a bulldog, or I'm a LSU tiger. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? We, we kind of do that. And I mean, you could even uh, take those who have strong families. I know not everyone does, but maybe your parents put some weight on your last name. I know we try to do this with our kids. Hey, you're a low 
There's a certain way that you carry yourself. You're a low. Hey, we don't do that because you're a low. We don't act like that. When we walk into a room and someone speaks to us, we look them in the eyes and we respond back to them. There's a certain way that we carry ourselves and because you're alone, we're teaching this and pouring this into our kids and attaching uh, some, some identity around connected to their name. You're alone. Now, if you know my son, um, he's 10, and of course, he has taken this too far uh, on several occasions. One time, his teacher in CC Kids told me after church one day that it was where they were just about to dismiss and they were giving out candy and they gave Guy a piece of candy and he was like, I want another piece. And they're like, no, you only get one piece. He was like, yes, I want another piece. And the teacher, they're, they're like going back and forth and Guy says, apparently you don't know who I am. <laughs> Lord, help me. There was another time, even at his elementary school, that the teacher was Tell him, hey, you can't do this, guy. And he goes, yes, I can. I'm a low. I'm, I'm just like, oh, Lord, what have I created here? But again, it may be with a sports team or it may be with a group that you're associated with. I was even thinking about Christ Church and, and the leaders here and what it means to be on the serve team. When you're on the serve team and you're a leader, there's just certain, a certain way that you carry yourself. And we want to make sure that our hearts are right. We want to make sure that we're serving with humility. We want to make sure that we're loving on people. We want to make sure that it's not about us, but it's about Jesus. We want to make sure that when we get here, that we're washing people's feet. We want to make sure that we're not trying to get famous, but we're trying to make Jesus famous. I think that's what makes our serve team so special. But it's this idea of, the name on the jersey, this decal on the helmet, and Jesus is saying, the spirit of the Lord is on me. There's this identity that the spirit of the Lord is on my life. And I was like, what does this mean? The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because there's other times that it, you see that the spirit of the Lord shows up in Scripture. I've just been doing some digging. I've been trying to mine out. What does this mean? Like what happens to a thing or a person when the spirit of the Lord is on them? Like there's something attached to that. There's some weight behind that. There's some identity behind that. Like you carry yourself in a certain way when the spirit of the Lord is on you. When you search the scriptures, I, I, just to be honest, I don't have time to go through the scriptures and talk about all the times in every instance where the Spirit of the Lord shows up. But in this moment, in Jesus' life, it was huge because this was the moment that he steps out and he, 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 it marks the beginning of his public ministry. He's telling everybody, I'm, I'm starting now. And when he starts beginning to read this scripture and applying it to himself, he was declaring that, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. And then he goes on and he begins to, to lay out his core mission of like, I'm here. I've been anointed to preach the good news to the poor, to bring freedom to people that have been bound up in their lives, to, to give sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I mean, we could talk about his mission all day long, and, and there's maybe we will at some other point. But I want us to focus on this idea when Jesus begins to read from Isaiah and him identifying that the Spirit of the Lord is on me and how it sets the stage for his ministry. It sets the stage for what he's about to do. And I believe that if we can just begin to understand and grab some understanding and begin to identify that the spirit of the Lord as a believer is on me, it will set the stage for your life as well. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write a couple of things down. The first thing is, when the spirit of the Lord is on you, it empowers you to embrace your anointing. The anointing 
symbolizes God commissioning you. That's what anointing is. It's, it's, it's the calling that he has on your life, the divine purpose, the task that he has for your life. You can see it many times in the Old Testament. You see people like Joshua being anointed to, to lead the people into Canaan. You see Gideon anointed, called to defeat the enemy. You see Samson anointed to protect the people. You see, David anointed to be king. And in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, you see the spirit coming up on people, falling on people, rushing on people to accomplish this divine calling that God has in their life. And praise God for that. Praise God for the moments that we can read about where, the, where this spiritual power comes over someone and they are anointed to do something for the kingdom of God. But here's what I want you to catch. That's Old Testament. We live in the New Testament, and because of Jesus, we live under a new covenant, and he told us that he was sending his spirit to live inside of us. I mean, you see it on the day of Pentecost in, in Acts 2. It says that the spirit came in like a rushing, mighty wind and fell upon everyone in the room. Everybody in the room. And here's what's exciting about that. We don't have to wait for the Spirit to fall on us. We don't have to wait for the Spirit to come over us. As believers, His Spirit now lives inside of us. His presence goes with us no matter what we're doing or where we're going to accomplish the call and the purpose, what we've been anointed to do. I'm thankful that God has uniquely created every single one of us with gifts and talents and abilities. And, and we say it all the time, when you give your gifts and I give my gifts, man, we are just so much stronger when we're together, when we're unified. But I just need you to understand this. Your gifts alone in and of themselves can never accomplish what God has for your life. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life working through you. It just propels you and gives you the strength and gives you the energy and it gives you the stamina that you need in your life to do what you've been anointed to do. So the Spirit comes in Acts chapter two and, and Peter, who was this ordinary guy before, I mean, we know him just just before, he's over here denying Christ, like cowering down in fear. Now, the Spirit comes up on him and is inside of him. It consumes him. And he stands up and declares the good news of Jesus. He didn't do it in his own strength. I mean, his own strength, he's afraid and he's running away. But the Spirit of God was on him. It was in him. Later, you see him he goes to the temple. Well, first he goes, he's going to the temple and he's going to worship and there's this lame man there and he's begging for, for some money. You know the story. They look at him and said, we don't have that. But what we do have, we'll give it to you freely. Stand up and walk in this lame man. Is that Peter and John? No, that's the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And then the next chapter over, you look and you find this same guy, Peter, the one that was afraid, that was running for his life, that was denying Christ, standing up, teaching all these well-educated people. All these people that knew way more about Scripture. He stands up and they are just so amazed and he stands before them and begins to deliver the gospel about Jesus Christ. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you realize that the Holy Spirit is in you, and when you realize that the Holy Spirit is working through you, can I just tell you, you just you begin to approach things a little bit differently. I can just, I'll just be completely honest and transparent. What, what I'm doing in this moment right now, I cannot do in my own strength. I don't have the words to say. Y'all know me. I mumble all the time. Half the time, people need somebody to decipher what I'm trying to say to them. I can't do this. 
I can't lead in my own strength. I have to have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life, not just on Sundays, but on Monday morning. Can I tell you, I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And when you realize that you have access to his spirit, it makes you walk into work a little bit differently. You walk in, you're not afraid. I know who's with me. I know who's behind me. I know who's pushing me on. And so when I walk up to the coffee pot and another coworker walks up, I know in this moment, maybe God has just created this divine appointment for me to have the boldness to speak out. I don't, I don't know what to say, Ryan. I don't care. Just start talking. The spirit will speak through you. I can't tell you how many times that I've been in a conversation that was way over my head and walked away from that conversation, scratching my head like, where did that come from? It's the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. At school, you walk around campus just a little bit different when you know you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's the name on the jersey. It's the decal on the helmet kind of idea. The spirit of the Lord is in me. Some identity attached to that. And we're empowered to embrace the calling that he has for our lives. The second thing is this. The Holy Spirit enables you to live victoriously. You read all the Bible, front to back, and you'll never find a moment Not one moment that the Spirit of the Lord came up on someone that caused them to shrink back. You can't ever find a moment in Scripture that the the Spirit of God caused someone to cower in fear. The Holy Spirit, this is going to be maybe a game changer for you. The Holy Spirit does not empower you to gossip. Rob liked that one. (laughs) The Holy Spirit doesn't empower you to take advantage of the people around you. No. It causes us. It enables us to live victoriously in every situation. It causes us to be victorious over sin and temptation in our lives. How does it do it? By convicting us. When we're out of line, when maybe we're doing something we know we shouldn't, it'll just be this little nudge of, and you just feel it, ugh, what, what am I doing? And it leads us to repentance and restoration. It causes us, it enables us to recognize the areas of our lives that, that we need to change. And I know that in today's culture, the, the whole world and the whole idea of conviction, and you know, people get that all confused. Like, don't, 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 don't shame me. Don't, don't condemn me. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn you. He convicts us. And he brings it to an awareness in our lives that, hey, I'm out of line right here. There's some things that I need to shift. There's some things that I need to change. It causes, helps, enables us to have victory over our thoughts and over our minds. Aligning our thoughts with God's truth instead of just allowing our mind or our emotions just to run wild. I've said this before, but our emotions are, you know what, I I shouldn't have gone there because I don't remember what I said. (laughs) I know what I said. Our emotions, your emotions were meant to complement your life, not dominate your life. And it's the renewing of your mind so we don't act like the world. We don't look like the world. He transforms us. He transforms our perspective, enables us to make the choices that we need that leads to victory. And it's one decision at a time. One decision at a time. One right decision over and over again. He gives us guidance and direction. How many times have we been there And it's just, I just don't know what to do. 
I mean, there's college kids that are, I don't know which direction to go in my career. Is this girl the right girl for me? Should I marry this person? Should I take this job opportunity? So many times we try to lean on our own understanding and we try to figure it out ourselves. And he's sitting there waiting just for us to ask and to listen to what he says. But unfortunately, Most of the time, our minds and our lives are so cluttered and so distracted by everything around us that we can't even hear his voice. But he's talking. He gives us, he leads us, and he guides us, not just in some areas, every area of our lives. I was talking with uh, my spiritual mentor, and he was talking about a gentleman that woke up one morning and just felt like the Holy Spirit told him he needed to wear a red shirt that day. He's like, I only had one red shirt, but I would put it on anyway. Showed up to a place, and another person walked up to him and said, I've been praying, and I asked God that if you're real, I need somebody to show up with a red shirt on today. I don't know... (laughs) Are you listening? That's the big question. He gives us strength in our weakness. When we feel inadequate, when we feel overwhelmed, he empowers us to persevere. He gives us the strength to hang on. When everybody else is throwing in the towel, we can hang on. When everybody else is walking away, we're staying. When everybody else is turning their back, we're pressing on. We're pushing forward because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in our lives. I love this one. He's praying and interceding on our behalf. Look, I'm thankful for my grandparents that were some praying grandparents. I'm thankful for my parents who I know my mom She wore the carpet out praying for me when I was in high school. I'm thankful for my personal intercessor that I know prays for me every single morning. But you know what's better than all that? Is the Holy Spirit interceding on my behalf. I'll take that any day. And in the moments that I don't know what to say, in the moments that I don't even know the questions or the words to put together to lift up an offering to to our creator, that's when he steps in and he begins to pray on your behalf about things that you don't even know. He gives us the power to serve. He equips us for everything that he has in store for our life, for every task, for every calling, for every appointed moment in your life, he has equipped you for that moment. Assurance of our salvation. He gives us confidence in God's promises, in eternal life. I mean, Paul writes, it's it's a hope that that anchors our soul. So it doesn't matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter what politically it looks like or, or, or economically society may look like. You know what? I don't have to fear. He hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but he's given me a sound mind and he's given me something, a hope that I can hang on to knowing that no matter what happens around me, that in the end, I'm gonna win. And he's going to work it all out for my good. And what happens is you begin living your life with this identity that the spirit of the Lord is on me. The spirit of the Lord is in me and all around me. You look up and now all of a sudden you're living this life that you've always dreamed of. You're living this abundant life that, that he talks about. And you look up and you've got love in your life. And you're able to extend love to people that, quite honestly, society would say they don't deserve it. But yet you're, you have the ability to love them. You have a little joy in your life. You have some peace in your life. When everybody at the office is pulling their hair out, man, I'm, I'm just calm. The Holy Spirit begins to produce some patience in your life. 
I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hands and don't nudge your husband right now, wives. But when we come home, we don't, we don't have to be wound up because the Holy Spirit is producing something inside of us. There's some kindness. There's some goodness. There's some faithfulness. There's some gentleness. There's some self-control that is now being produced in our life. The Spirit of the Lord is, is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord, I want you to get this. I want you to walk out of here. And maybe you had a, a different name on the back of the jersey or on the side of the helmet when you walk in, walked in. But I want you to walk out of here with this idea in your mind that the Spirit of the Lord is on me. I want you to attach yourself to that and connect yourself to that and walk out of this room today knowing that it doesn't matter what you're walking into. It doesn't matter the environment that you're about to step into because the God of the universe has placed his spirit inside of you and has empowered you for, for whatever situation that you're going to face. Amen. You received that word this morning. Come on, put your hands together. Why don't you bow your heads all across the room and as we conclude today, there's some of you that walked in here and, and we're talking about the power that the Holy Spirit brings to your life. But you know you're not on the team yet. You know you don't have that working in your life right now to produce the love, the joy, and the peace, and the patience, and the kindness, and the goodness, and the self-control that you know you need in your life. I'm just here to tell you, I want to bring you some good news this morning. The Bible teaches that just believe in your heart and confess that he is Lord, that you will be saved. And his Holy Spirit, he will put his Holy Spirit in you to lead you and to guide you all through life's crooks and turns. He will be there with you to walk with you. So if that's you, and you know you've never made a profession of faith, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I just want you to slip up your hand all across the room. Right there in Ruston, right there in Sterling. Slip it up high. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for being bold. Thank you for being honest with yourself. I mean, this is a place, one of our core values, to live authentically. We believe you need to be authentic with God. You need to be authentic with yourself. You need to be real with yourself, real with the people around you. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray with all of our friends this morning that slipped up their hands, and I can't explain it. I've said this before, but it's in that moment. It's not just the words that you say. It's the posture of your heart. And it's in that moment as you begin to pray and confess that Jesus is Lord, that his spirit sweeps down and rescues your soul. So can we pray together out loud? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm asking you to forgive me for trying to do life my own way. I recognize that you came that you lived a sinless life and you willingly gave it up just for me. Thank you. My heart is full of gratitude. Today I proclaim that you are the one true God and you're my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, Christ Church. Can we just put our hands together and celebrate? Amen. Amen.